Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I conclude my two-part discussion on S.S. Van Dyne's 20 Rules for Writing Detective Fiction, and I will also occasionally refer to Ronald Knox's Ten Commandments for Detective Fiction, which largely overlap. There are no spoilers for any works in this video, and before I begin, make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel to keep up to date. Starting off at rule number 11, a rule that I don't particularly care for, quote, a servant must not be chosen by the author as the culprit. This is begging a noble question. It is a too easy solution. The culprit must be a decidedly worthwhile person, one that wouldn't ordinarily come under suspicion, unquote. And there's this infamous cliche in detective fiction of, you know, the butler did it, which originated in a Mary Roberts Reinhardt novel that I won't name, and Roberts didn't even use that phrase, but there really aren't that many novels that come to mind in which the butler or another servant did it. Yes, I can think of some, but to me, it's not like an overwhelmingly common solution. This rule has origins in classism, to be honest. Most mystery writers came from the middle and upper classes who see the lower class as thieves and whatnot, Van Dyne is essentially saying that it's not at all surprising a servant would be a murderer. And I personally don't care if a servant is the culprit or not, so as long as it's a solvable mystery puzzle. I understand this solution is cliche because of the phrase the butler did it. It's not really as common as I think people think it is. And servants typically play very important roles in Christie novels and in Roderick Allen novels. You know, Inspector Fox is infamous for his handling of the ladies downstairs. This is simply not a rule I look for or knock if a book breaks it. Rule number 12 states, quote, There must be but one culprit no matter how many murders are committed. The culprit may, of course, have a minor helper or co-plotter, but the entire onus must rest on one pair of shoulders. The entire indignation of the reader must be permitted to concentrate on a single black nature." Unquote. This is another rule that I'm not super strict on, but seems to be heavily followed both in the golden era and today. Personally, I think having multiple culprits elevates the mystery in a fair way, but a lot of authors keep this as just one culprit. Even when we have like a murderous duo or accomplices, one member of the group is the mastermind, the big bad that needs to be taken down. We often don't even get a resolution over what happens to like those lesser culprits in these books. I don't really buy into Van Dyne's suggestion that having multiple culprits is somehow unfair or deceitful, as long as the other rules regarding fair play are followed. But again, this appears to be followed even today. The only major novel that comes to my mind that breaks this, and this isn't a spoiler because I won't reveal the killers, is Cat Among the Pigeons, where we have two murderers working independently of each other and piggybacking off of the other's crimes. It's actually quite genius. It's a shame that more authors aren't willing to experiment in this way. Rule number 13 states, quote, Secret societies, Camorras, mafias et al., have no place in a detective story. A fascinating and truly beautiful murder is irredeemably spoiled by any such wholesale culpability. To be sure, the murderer in a detective novel should be given a sporting chance, but it is going too far to grant him a secret society to fall back on. No high-class, self-respecting murderer would want such odds." Unquote. And this rule is largely followed and remains so. I wouldn't be so strict on this one either. While I agree that personal, more intimate murders are ideal for the traditional mystery novel, I wouldn't go as far as to forbid secret societies. I think there are interesting things that can be done with them, but I also understand where Van Dyne is coming from. You don't want a mystery novel to have professional criminals and indiscriminate killings. That is a whole different genre. I struggle to think of novels that break this rule. The likes of like The Seven Dials Mystery by Agatha Christie and Spinsters in Jeopardy by Niall Marsh have secret society or secret society-like groups featured within, but those books are largely thriller with a mystery element, and the secret societies aren't functioning in the same way Van Dyne suggests. Perhaps another Roderick Allen novel in Death and Ecstasy could be an example, but that has a church cult, which does not function in the way Van Dyne means either. What Van Dyne is saying is that the solution to the murder should not be like a mob hit or the doings of some large-scale criminal enterprise that makes the murderer very difficult to bring to justice, but he phrases it in such a broader way than I would.
Rule number 14 states, quote, the method of murder and the means of detecting it must be rational and scientific, that is to say, pseudoscience and purely imaginative and speculative devices are not to be tolerated in the roman policier. Once an author soars into the realm of fantasy in the Jules Verne manner, he is outside the bounds of detective fiction, cavorting in the uncharted reaches of adventure, unquote. This rule should be much higher on the list than number 14 because it is one of the most important ones. The reader has to be able to solve the crime. And when the writer is diving into fictional poisons and fantastical elements, that becomes impossible. Agatha Christie used fictional poisons in multiple novels, including The Caribbean Mystery and The Mirror Crack from Side to Side, which are just two examples. I think this rule is a must follow, but when Christie broke them, she broke them in a way that it didn't matter. There was no scientific deduction needed to determine the poison was, you know, serenite or calmo or whatever she invented. The mechanics of the mystery did not rely on scientific knowledge, although I would still prefer authors avoid using such fakes. The other thing to talk about in this category is some of the Lord Peter Whimsey novels. I won't name which, but there are two books, really three, that are not scientifically accurate, but were believed to be such when Sayers wrote them. We know today these methods are not possible. And I wouldn't say Sayers broke this rule because she believed she was following it. Lord Peter is the next series I'm ranking, and I am debating over what to do with these books on the list. I and mean, there's so many possibilities. I don't want to like punish it too much, but you know it, it has to be deducted. And the final thing here is there are now a number of like mystery slash fantasy and mystery and science fiction blends, which I would exempt from this rule for obvious reasons. Rule number fifteen states, "Quote." The truth of the problem must at all times be apparent, provided the reader is shrewd enough to see it. By this, I mean that if the reader, after learning the explanation for the crime, should reread the book, he would see that the solution had, in a sense, been staring him in the face, that all the clues really pointed to the culprit, and that if he had been as clever as the detective, he could have solved the mystery himself without going on to the final chapter." That the clever reader does often thus solve the problem goes without saying. Unquote. And I love rereading mystery novels with the knowledge of who the culprit is and how the solution unfolded. It's a totally new reading experience and often a very fun one. As a rule, I wouldn't say there isn't much going on in this one that isn't functioning in other rules. This is essentially yet another way for Van Dyne to stress the fair play elements. I mean, I think about the Ellery Queen stories, especially the earlier ones where there would be the um, the challenge to the reader where the narration would stop and we would be told, you can now solve all of the crimes, all the problems, the, the how, the who, the where, the whatever. And, you know, often I found that wasn't really truly the case, but that's something I think of when I think of this rule. The truth of the problem being apparent, that doesn't really say much. What Van Dyne is concerned here in as few words as possible, is that the solution isn't so hidden that it becomes unsolvable. And then on a reread, you can see the little path playing out. Rule number 16 states, quote, A detective novel should contain no long descriptive passages, no literary dallying with side issues, no subtly worked out character analysis, no atmospheric preoccupations. Such matters have no vital place in a record of crime and deduction. They hold up the action and introduce issues irrelevant to the main purpose, which is to state a problem, analyze it, and bring it to a successful conclusion. To be sure, there must be a sufficient descriptiveness and character delineation to give the novel verisimilitude. Let's take this jumble piece by piece. I agree with the no descriptive passages, and I would extend this to any piece of literature, even beyond mystery novels. I do not need pages and pages and chapter after chapter of description. It's distracting, and it makes me think the author only cares about depicting some real-life place and not the mystery or the plot itself. I would not go as far as Van Dyne and say it has no place in detective fiction. An author does need to evoke the setting of place and time, and some authors brilliantly use the setting as part of the mystery. 
but what needs to they need to do this as economically as possible without diving into like a travel log like narrative i think of color scheme where nio marsh beautifully describes the new zealand countryside with its hills and mud pools and makes it plot relevant one can tell that van dyne created these rules in the 1920s in the aftermath of world war 1 the public needed comfort that when the order is destroyed the good people of the world will restore that order and nothing else matters. Mattered. I find this rule in particularly unnecessarily restrictive and limiting. No one follows any part of this rule at all, and even at the time, it wasn't really much followed. I think this rule contributes to the idea that mystery writing is somehow a lesser genre of literature because traditionally you wouldn't have evoked settings or developed characters. There would be no in-depth meaning or statement. This practice is long gone, but the stigma remains. Now let's talk about the second part, about no worked out character analyses. This is garbage. The characters make or break a mystery novel for the most part. It's very difficult to invest your time and effort into reading a story when you don't care about the characters or when the characters aren't interesting or relatable. But Van Dyne views characters as mere tools to push forward the mystery plot. They don't matter individually, only their roles. This is why early detective fiction contains a lot of stock characters because authors wouldn't develop them beyond their role as, you know, the police officer or the victim or what have you. This is just ridiculous, honestly. And Van Dyne throws in the end there like this, like, yeah, some description and character is needed, but it's just tossed in a way that makes me think he doesn't actually mean that. And Agatha Christie broke this rule constantly. And I think that's what contributes to why she is the greatest mystery writer of all time. She broke the mold of routine and boredom. She transformed detective fiction into something beyond the mere puzzle to be solved so the hoi polloi could feel comfort in times of chaos. She elevated detective fiction into a respectable genre of literature. Rule number 17 states, quote, a professional criminal must never be shouldered with the guilt of a crime in a detective story. Crimes by housebreakers and bandits are the province of the police departments, not of authors and brilliant amateur detectives. A really fascinating crime is one committed by a pillar of a church or a spinster noted for her charities. Unquote. This is yet another rule that I support partially and reject partially. I agree that a professional criminal as the guilty party is just boring and disappointing, but there are very interesting ways of using professional criminals as guilty parties. I just covered Anthony Barclay Cox's works, and he has a fantastic novel, and I won't spoil which, where the guilty party is a professional criminal, but he uses it in such a fascinating way that it doesn't disappoint. We also have a number of novels where one of the characters is secretly a professional criminal. Again, I won't spoil, but this is also a pretty interesting take because the reader experiences the traditional mystery puzzle, but you have this contradicting solution that someone isn't who they presented themselves to be. The second part of this rule is essentially saying the more unlikely the suspect, the better the killer they are. I agree, but there are too many variations of this. Who is the least likely person? That is such an open question that varies from novel to novel and from time to time. Nowadays, I don't think this matters too much. Readers are going to suspect everyone. I don't think readers in 2023 are likely to write off the pillar of the church or the charitable spinster. I can't think of any type of character or person a reader today is going to write off purely because of their position or career. I mean, you have the board game Clue, where the character of Reverend Green was renamed Mr. Green when the game debuted in the U.S. because it was believed Americans wouldn't accept a reverend as a murder suspect. And this change is reflected in the present day, where Mr. Green is now more and more often referred to as the Reverend Green in the U.S. And I'd like to point out that this rule about the least likely suspect being the culprit directly contradicts the previous rule about no character analysis. If someone is the least likely culprit, we have to believe they are guilty, which requires character development. It's not enough to say, like, Mrs. X is a rich elderly spinster who volunteers to feed the homeless and then tell us she murdered three people with no exposition in between. Rule number 18 states, quote, A crime in a detective story must never turn out to be an accident or a suicide. To end an odyssey of sleuthing with such an anticlimax is to hoodwink the trusting and kind-hearted reader, unquote. 
I fully reject this rule as well. I disagree a suicide or an accident is anticlimactic in any way, so as long as the writer is able to construct a full-length novel around such and convince us of its genius. This is a device seen more often in like short stories than in novels where the stakes aren't so high, but there are novels that break this rule, and they do it in a spectacular fashion. I won't mention titles here because that would be an obvious spoiler, but in general terms, we have like the suicide made to look like murder. We have accidents made to look like murder. We have natural deaths made to look like murder. We have all of those things appear to be murder by pure chance and not intentional setup, and they're all very satisfying conclusions. I don't think I need to point out that there are plenty of murder mysteries that are anticlimactic when there's an actual murder in them and aren't worth the time either. Rule number 19 states, quote, The motives for all crimes in detective stories should be personal. International plottings and war politics belong in a different category of fiction, in Secret Service tales, for instance, but a murder story must be kept gumlich, so to speak. It must reflect the reader's everyday experiences and give him a certain outlet for his own repressed desires and emotions, unquote. I've been critical of the mystery novels that try to blend the more traditional aspects of a mystery novel with a thriller. We see a lot of this from like Agatha Christie, especially early on in her career. Lord Peter Whimsey has a few of these. The biggest violator of this rule is probably Niall Marsh with Roderick Allen often finding himself caught up in like international drug smuggling. We see this in Spinsters in Jeopardy, Death and Ecstasy, When in Rome. I agree with Van Dyne, these topics are best left to another genre, the full-on action-adventure thrillers. I personally find the more intimate motives to be more intriguing. It's similar to the no-career criminal rule, but I wouldn't say this is a must-follow. Even in those Marsh novels have this intimate setting. Roderick Allen is not James Bond in these books. He's investigating as if he's like the normal homicide police officer. Marsh and Christie attempt to shrink the setting to just the one location, so even if there is this like thriller intrigue going on, it is still more on the intimate scale, and it often have very satisfying conclusions. In case you were like me and didn't understand the German word gumlich, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, it roughly translates to cozy, but Van Dyne isn't using that word in the modern parlance. I'll do a video sometime in the future about cozy mysteries and the history of them, but what Van Dyne is referring to here is the cozy setting, which in the 1920s meant essentially that all of the characters were familiar with each other, and the story took place in a familiar setting to the reader. The reader will understand the characters and the setting and the plot in the 1920s cozy in a way they would not in like an international thriller. In the 1920s, there were only two categories of mystery novels the hard-boiled or cozy, with cozy being all of the novels not having like a grittiness to them, like Sam Spade or something like a James Bond spy novel, which, you know, they hadn't appeared, but books along it along that line. Rule number 20, Van Dyne's final rule states, quote, and I herewith list a few of the devices which no self-respecting detective story writer will now avail himself of. They have been employed too often and are familiar to all true lovers of literary crime. To use them is a confession of the author's ineptitude and lack of originality. A. Determining the identity of the culprit by comparing the butt of a cigarette left at the scene of the crime with the branch smoked by a suspect. B. The bogus spiritualistic seance to frighten the culprit into giving himself away. C. Forged fingerprints. D. The dummy figure alibi. E. The dog that does not bark and thereby reveals the fact that the intruder is familiar. F. The final pinning of the crime on a twin or a relative who looks exactly like the suspected but innocent person. G. The hypodermic syringe and the knockout drops. H. The commission of the murder in a locked room after the police have actually broken in. I. The word association test for guilt. J. The cipher or code letter, which is eventually unraveled by the sleuth. Unquote. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I am largely in agreement. These are all cliche tropes that even in the 1920s had grown stale. 
We still see some of these being used today, and it's just as bad as always. The twin one probably being the most obnoxious and egregious. There are novels that do use some of these tropes in like an interesting way. You can use twins a little differently than a simple case of mistaken identity. You can use like forged fingerprints in interestingly. Christy did that in The Hollow, but whenever a good writer uses these tropes, it's usually either in a satirical way or twisting it about giving it new life. Ronald Knox has one about not allowing more than one secret passageway. I personally would go as far as to say never use any secret passageway. This rule can best be summed up by calling these tropes cop-outs. This is what they are, very easy and uncreative solutions to get out of pretty much any problem. And if you cannot get out of your problem in an interesting, fresh way, then your mystery plot probably isn't very good to begin with. And that concludes Van Dyne's 20 rules, but there are two rules from Ronald Knox's Ten Commandments that don't have equivalent in those 20 rules, and I'll talk about them here. The first of these is Knox's Sixth Commandment, and I do apologize for this language, but I'm just going to read it as Knox wrote it. Quote, no Chinaman must figure in the story, unquote. And let's just extend this to no awful racial stereotypes at all. And yes, I know times change and sentiment changes. What was acceptable in the 1920s may not be acceptable now, and who knows what will be acceptable in the 2120s. Van Dyne specifically refers to Asian men here because the yellow peril offensive stereotypes were reigning supreme, with villains like Fu Manchu and Li Cheng Yang being very prominent and ubiquitous. You even have like Charlie Chan novels being something of a counter to this, but those were also quite offensive. Thankfully, this problem is largely gone from detective stories nowadays, at least in terms of these offensive portrayals reflecting the author's point of view. This rule is about the portrayal of people of color and not any sentiment a character might have or any belief they may hold. There are obviously still characters who are racist and prejudiced, but it's not done in a way that gives the silent nod of approval. The other one is commandment number nine, which states, quote, the sidekick of the detective, the Watson, must not conceal from the reader any thoughts which pass through his mind. His intelligence must be slightly, but very slightly, below that of the average reader, unquote. Part of this commandment was already covered under fair play, but let's talk about sidekicks. The idea of the sidekick being slightly below average is to provide the reader the excitement of beating the sidekick to the solution. This is why the sidekick sometimes comes across as like an idiot, as we see in the likes of like Watson or Hastings, who frequently served as first person narrator. But even after the detective story started to be told from the third person perspective, the sidekicks typically remained on the duller side, the likes of like Inspector Fox or Charles Parker. The only exception who comes to my mind is Inspector Moresby, who is infinitely smarter than Roger Sheringham. The reason why the sidekick has to be slightly unintelligent is because they are the narrator, and they cannot withhold the, their thoughts for fair play reasons, but they cannot be smart because they would solve the crime instantly and ruin any suspense or interest. Overall, I think this has gone by the wayside. We actually don't even have a lot of true detective sidekicks anymore. What we typically see is like a friend of the detective who doesn't really contribute to the investigation other than to be like happen to be with the detective at the time of the murder. I'm fine with that. I don't think we need sidekicks, although I do love sidekicks. But as long as the detective is interesting enough, I think they're fine without them. And that concludes my discussion on the many rules of detective fiction from both S.S. Van Dyne and Ronald Knox. Next week, I have another discussion. This time, I will be giving my thoughts on the Agatha Christie continuations. And by that, I mean the five Hercule Poirot novels written by Sophie Hanna and the Miss Marple short story collection from 12 different authors. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.